remember emojis for this class more. It's, I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. Okay. <laughs> Mostly negative emotions. So. <laughs> that that was a cry for help. No, it wasn't. It's not good. I mean, it is good to joke about it, but it is also a serious topic. Um, so let's talk about first order measurement systems. So now, you know, we're no longer in this completely ludicrous world where everything happens instantaneously and all that. But we're not getting too crazy with it. We're just going up to first order. This is just one. So first order measurement systems have the input output differential equation. 3.9, so this tau we call the time constant here. And we have a first derivative of the output. And u is our input. We can have up to a first derivative of our input. Now, I want to try to dispel some potential confusion right now, but we'll see if this is actually going to work. Um, there, uh, we sometimes will toggle back and forth between talking about the input, u, and the forcing function, which is everything over here. Forcing function. And Sometimes we're a little fast and loose with that terminology. Um, the important thing is to try to understand from context what's being described. Uh, I try to be pretty good about it, but occasionally we'll talk about the input when we mean the forcing function and vice versa. So. Um, some people don't differentiate between those two terms, but I think it's important to do so. Uh, OK. So measurement systems with a single energy storage element, such as those with electrical or thermal capacitance, can be modeled with first order systems like this. Uh, also a system that has damping, but doesn't have any inertial element associated with it could also be um, a first order mechanical system. Uh, and then there are analogous other types of systems as well, fluid systems as well, that could, could have this. But um, it, this actually does uh, represent a fair number of systems. And, and uh, we're going to see from the, the response what's really sort of characteristic about it. So commonly a scaling of the unit step function, us, which is 0 for all negative time, and one for all non-negative time, um, can be considered the input to this and other measurement systems. For example, whenever the input is changed suddenly, the step function is a good approximation. If we consider the common situation that B1 is zero, so we're gonna set, we're not gonna differentiate the input, we're just gonna have some scaling of the input here. Um, then, and we have the, the step function. So if it's a unit step function multiplied by something, we call it the step, a step function. So some non-unity step function. For some k, the solution to equation 3.9, this equation is y of t equals y of 0, so this was the initial condition, uh, minus kb0 e to the minus t over tau plus kb 
zero. So we are pretty familiar with this expression, right? Something like this. This is something we've seen a lot when we're solving our circuit differential equations in mechatronics, right? This is something that comes up all the time. We have two components, you could say, one of which is the exponential decay. And this term that exponentially decays, what do we call that? This thing that's left over after, the, after it decays. Steady state, exactly, and then the transient is the other. So this one's the steady state, and this is the transient. So this one goes away after six time constants, five time constants or so, um, and the steady state one remains. If we assume the steady state solution is the proper measurement value. So if we assume that this is where we want to go right here, we want. Um, the transient response is error. Okay, So we don't want this, really. We want this to be zero order. We, in other words, we want time constant to be zero, so that this collapses to the steady state immediately. But, of course, it's never actually zero. Uh, considering it never reaches zero, um, so the transient solution, that is, never reaches zero in finite time, this is a bummer. However, it does decay exponentially, so in five time constants, transient response is less than 1% of the difference between the initial condition and steady state. Part of the SIP response is shown in the figure 3.4. So there we go. Step input, meaning this is, this is what we're trying to measure. Measure... And, and when it comes in, our first order measurement system takes a little while to get there. It decays exponentially to there. So during this region, it's transient, and then it gets to the steady state. So KB0 is just a result of the fact that we put in, for you, we put in u equals k times the unit step. And this k multiplies the b0. So that's what our kb0 is. So you know, this is like, if it's a first order system, it decays there. If you wait long enough, you're going to get there. Um, not too bad. Um, good. Now, step inputs to first order systems, uh, you know, they behave pretty nicely. So, I mean, I solved it right here. We've been in, in uh, mechatronics class, we've been like solving this by hand, right? But we know this is the answer because we've done it like 50 times. So, we just solved it for all possible cases in this equation. <laughs> yeah, you know. No, no big deal. Just like all possible cases. Um, <laughs> that's all. Yeah, so this, by the way, I actually don't care. If in your, if in your uh, mechatronics class you're, you want to use like solutions to a differential equation that you've done before and you say, oh, well, this is of this form, so this is the differential equation, fine. I don't care. Fine with me. You just better be prepared for every possible case on an exam. Uh, good. Okay, considering it never reaches zero. Oh, yeah, we already did that. So, good. So, this is, this is all good. We, we like this. But 
a step input is not the only type of input uh, or measure and that we're interested to measure, right? So that's, that's one type, and it's actually very common. Like, it, something changes, you want to measure, um, uh, for instance, the speed of the car, and you brake suddenly. You want your speedometer to catch up, but it isn't immediate. It takes a little bit to catch up. So this is uh, another type of another type of measure end that we would like to measure is one not that just changes suddenly, but one that is sinusoidal. So it just cyclic goes up and down in a sinusoidal, and that's actually. This is very common. So if, uh, for instance, you were going to measure how much a system is vibrating, vibrations tend to come through sinusoidally. Um, there are actually, as we will see, uh, many more cases of, of a signal coming in that's not a sinusoid, a perfect sinusoid, but that is the superposition of a bunch of sinusoids, which is to say the sum of a bunch of sinusoids which is to say, a Fourier series. We'll get there, don't worry. We'll get there. We're not there yet. We'll talk about it. But um, the sinusoidal response is the foundation for our discussion of the, the uh, periodic function response. OK. Um, so it's common. We'll say it's a sine omega t. Um, and if we say that B1 is zero again, so we're not going to worry about the derivative of the input in this case, which it doesn't come up very frequently that we'll have to deal with the derivative of the input. When it does come up, uh, we can always go back to the differential equation and, and deal with it. Um, I actually recommend using the principle of superposition to solve that in that case. But you guys don't know that yet, but you'll learn it in probably mechatronics. Maybe systems, probably mechatronics. Hopefully. So, uh, excellent. So the solution is just, notice how I'm just giving you guys the solution and not solving it or making you solve it. Um, that's on purpose. So kappa e to the minus t over tau. Now, this kappa is familiar to those in mechatronics. Th this is the, the um, constant that's determined by the initial condition. Um, and then plus, it's B0 A divided by the square root of 1 plus omega ta squared times sine of omega t minus the arctan of omega t, o omega ta. Yeah, it is. And so we often will call this something specific, and we will do so in a minute. But this is the phase, right? And this is the, the magnitude. But we'll get there. Goodbye. So uh, and I also went ahead and solved for the initial condition, too, because, because you're welcome. Um, our book does some of this, by the way. It does not solve for kappa for you, though. That's a special gift from me. Don't say I never do anything for you guys. I did that for you. I hope it's right. Um, <laughs> Great first job. What's kappa? <laughs> so this is uh, uh, the initial condition. And it's kind of messy. That's why we didn't plug it in there. Right? It's out of the messy. But once again, we've, been, we've split our solution up into, well, what is typically, um, this is the steady state, right? 
And technically, I mean, we, we often will, will call this the transient, although it is a little bit deceptive to call this the transient. Technically, all this is the transient during the period for which this is dominant, right? We'll often just kind of oversimplify and call this the transient. But while this e to the minus t over the top thing is decaying, we still have this sinusoid just winding away over here, right? So we can't just say, I mean, the transient is really these two together during that period where it's decaying. OK. Um, uh, good. So figure 3.5 shows uh, responses of a first order measurement system to sinusoidal inputs or measurands at different frequencies omega. So that is, where is that? Aha, look at this pretty figure. This is what I spend all my time on, just so you guys know. It's the figures. <laughs> like, they're really fun to make. Have a good time. So, OK. This is the, the forcing function for um, uh, different frequencies. OK? So if I, I shift the frequency, notice I'm just like incrementally shifting it a little bit away from pi. And so I'm slowing it down from pi. And so it's stretching it out in time. And the dashed lines are the inputs, and then the solid lines are the outputs. And the colors correspond to each other. So the, the blue one is when omega is equal to pi. So the dashed blue line comes in, and then the, the solid blue line comes out. So notice that we've got this nice decay action happening, right? And then the sinusoid is going around that decay. So this, the, the decaying exponential is going away. And once it's pretty much gone after five, five six time constants, um, then we say we're in steady state. Now, uh, notice some other things about this. Once we're in steady state, we've got so a sinusoid went in, a sinusoid comes out. It's at the same frequency. One thing that changed is very obvious. The amplitude changed, right? So the difference in height. Let's see if I can actually get on there. The difference in height there, that's, that's apparent, right? And the other thing that changed is, it's a little harder to see this, but the peaks are shifted too. There's also this shift here, which is a phase offset. So those two things happen. And it's a little less obvious, but you can tell that these peaks, as you change the frequency, the, the peaks actually are changing height and they're changing phase shift too. So, so the, the difference in height and the difference in phase changes depending on the frequency. And that's kind of like the, you know, one of the big um, conceptual ideas there. And that makes total sense, right? Because our, mag our amplitude here is a function of the frequency. So as you increase the frequency, this is definitely going to become a smaller and smaller fraction. So the sinusoid is going to have a smaller and smaller amplitude. The output sinusoid will. Um, and then similarly, the, the phase shift is also a function of omega. So as you increase omega, you also increase the phase shift. So those are the two, the two main takeaways from that. Uh, good. Note that the transient response decays with the same rate tau, no matter the input frequency. So it didn't matter that we changed the input frequency. It's still, the transient's still going to be gone, even if we did some really high frequency or some really low frequency. This transient happens the same rate. 
And that's because in the equation, this is decoupled from this term. So this term over here is going to happen regardless of omega. Um, this term doesn't depend on omega at all. Okay. Uh, good. However, there are two differences. It's the amplitude and the phase. Um, in fact, the steady state amplitude and phase of an output compared to an input present a form of error in the measurement. Ideally, the ratio of the output and input is unity. However, for positive omega, this is never quite the case. We define this ratio, called the magnitude ratio, to be the steady state output amplitude over the forcing amplitude. For first order systems, m of omega is equal to 1 divided by the square root of 1 plus omega ta squared. So we took, we took the amplitude of the output and we divided um, it by the amplitude of the input. And the amplitude of the input was, or of the, of the forcing function was B naught A. So we just divided the B naught A out. And we ended up with this magnitude ratio. A metric for the nearness of m of omega to unity is called the dynamic error and is given by literally the most obvious thing you could write down for I want to know how far away m of omega is from 1 so, so you just say oh you mean that and then yeah that's it so you want it to be 1 you want m of omega to be 1 because you want the dynamic error to be 0 right if you want the output amplitude to be the same as the input amplitude because you're really a fan of measuring things that are the same as what you're trying to measure. So you want your measurement value to correspond to the actual value, the measure amp. So ideally delta of omega is zero, but as we can see from the expression for m of omega, this is only ever approximately true. Uh, 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 Oh yeah, this is only ever approximately true for non-zero tau and omega. So tau and omega, if they're zero, then this is one, right? And our delta of omega is zero. But for positive omega tau, we're pretty much stuck with there being some, uh, some error here. However, it is small when the product of omega tau is small. So in order to minimize dynamic error for the measurement of a sinusoid at a given frequency, we must strive to minimize the time constant tau. It is common to call good enough magnitude ratios that are greater than 0.707. So you might say for a, a given system, OK, it's got a time constant of whatever it's got. Let's figure out um, which frequency corresponds to m of omega equal to 0 0.707. And then we can determine um, what range of frequencies this, this uh, uh, measurement system is valid for. We're not going to let it go more than that. Otherwise, we're just, if too much error, we don't want to deal with that. Too much error. So this is one way to use a sort of uh, rule of thumb to determine if this is a proper, um, a proper frequency we can measure, is if, if this is true. So that's, uh, that's a commonly used metric. Similarly, the phase difference of the output relative to the input is ideally zero, right? So it'd be nice if there was no phase difference. Um, Therefore, the phase shift, V of omega, is another type of error, and uh, for first order systems is given by V of omega equals negative arctan of omega tau. 
This corresponds to a time delay, which we'll call beta 1 of omega, in uh, uh, the measurement. So beta 1 is related to the phase by the frequency. So it is phi of omega divided by omega. And that's the time delay. So clearly, we don't want time delay. Time delay is bad news. Um, so we want to minimize phi of omega and beta of omega. Typically, this is achieved by minimizing the time constant, which corresponds to the minimization of the time constant for the minimiz minimization of the dynamic error. So in all cases, smaller tau is better, right? Like, it fortunately didn't work out that it was like, oh, for one of them, it's better to have longer, shorter. Note that the steady state response of the measurement system to sinusoidal inputs is characterized by m of omega and phi of omega. In fact, a crucial identity will be observed here. The magnitude ratio m of omega and phase phi of omega are equal to the magnitude and phase of the frequency response function, h of j omega. So that's uh, one way to get to this point without having to find the solution to your differential equation and all that is just to find the frequency response function, which is much easier to find um, than solving the differential equation. Um, this is recognized as being the complex amplitude of the output over the input, and they're plotted in this figure here. So I plot them um, versus this dimensionless angular frequency omega tau. So what we see is that at low frequency, the magnitudes of the output and the input are about the same, and then the output magnitude drops as you increase the frequency. Okay, that's the, that's the first big thing. Also notice that the phase drops from zero to ends up at negative 90 degrees. So we're better down here, we're worse out here as far as the dynamic error goes. And we said our cutoff was going to be at 0.707. That was a, a conventional thing. That's right here, actually. And that occurs at omega um, equals 1 over tau, also known as the cutoff frequency or break frequency for a first order system. So usually we want to be working in this region here. This is our, our measurement bandwidth, you can say. Uh, if we want to measure a frequency that's out here, we have to lower our time constant so that we can include that in this region. OK, that's, I mean, it's a whirlwind tour, but that, that's first order measurement systems. Are there any questions? I can let you guys go after that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, what's up? So for like the dynamic error, mm -hmm. if your uh, whatever it is, m omega mm -hmm. is supposed to be greater than 707, 0707. So that gives you a, a dynamic error of what, negative 30? Point th is, it, is it a percent it's error a, or is it? Well, you could write it as a percent, but so if m was equal to 0 0.707, that means that delta is negative 0.2. Yeah, negative uh, 0.29. Yeah. So that's about as that's about the max we want to deal with. I mean, we we prefer to be better than that, but that's like as as bad as we're usually willing to like let it get. This number means what to me? Uh, it's it's it, it's actually it's twenty nine percent, and so what it's saying is that the output magnitude or the output amplitude right here, the output amplitude is 
0.707 times the input amplitude, which is like over here. We're actually this is this is bad news right here because th this is clearly uh, less than 0.707. It's probably yeah, yeah it's yeah it's half or less. Uh, so we're in the bad range here. That means that the input amplitude is much bigger than the output amplitude. So we're not getting a good reflection of what the actual magnitude is. Now, I will say you can calibrate systems to recognize that this is happening, right? So at different frequencies, it can recognize that there's this amplitude ratio and you have this dynamic error. But you have to compensate for it. So it's fine as long as you're aware of it. Um, but you still have to deal with the time delay, right? The time delay is really there. So as long as you don't aren't concerned about the fact that it's delayed in time, um, it's fine. But unfortunately, it, it only gets behind by 90 degrees, and then it stops. It won't get far behind anymore. So you can go up a higher and higher frequency. 90 degrees is as far behind as it's going to get for a first order system. Second order, you can get behind by 180 degrees. All right. Cool. There are no other questions. I will see you on Wednesday.